In Switzerland, in the heart of the Valais Mountains, just a few years ago, Brach was a fading village with an aging population. But four years ago, a team of young teachers reopened the school and gave the village a future once again. For the youngest children, the school has a single class of about 20 pupils, aged 4 to 8, and the teachers stimulate their senses through playing. Who wants to be in the middle? We'll start with Serene. Can you see anything? No, you have to check. They're playing, but actually Serene has to guess how many children go under her legs. It's a fun way to practice counting. Our starting point is the fact that every child who comes into the world spontaneously wants to learn by running, walking or speaking. It's innate. We mustn't destroy that. The most important thing is to create an environment which preserves that curiosity. And we think the best way to learn is to play, to discover and to experiment. It's all about emotion. So, Céline, how many children do you think went through? Fifteen. Fifteen? How many were there? Ten. Ten. That's right. You counted too many. <laughs> Thank you. When he was a child, Damien Gusponna was bored at school. As an adult, he's created the school he dreamt about. It prepares its pupils for future challenges in an atmosphere of joy and enthusiasm, with one basic principle, to develop children's knowledge out of their own ideas. We don't work in subjects where the main thing is to sit down, listen and write. We try to cover everything through cross-disciplinary projects. Serene has set up a project with three of her friends. We have a tortoise project. That means we're going to have tortoises in school. They'll come here when they've finished hibernating. The tortoise project is a perfect example of cross-disciplinary learning. The little tortoise enthusiasts will gain skills in drawing, maths, German biology and even in communication. We drew a lot of pictures. Here we drew four tortoises because we're four friends. This is another one. To say that tortoises eat this, this and this. We sold cakes and collected all this money to buy the tortoises and then... Here we made a sign to tell people why we were selling cakes. When a child suggests a project on tortoises, for example, they have to find out what the animal needs to remain healthy. They have to work out what equipment is needed and how much it will cost. They have to do a lot of maths, learn vocabulary, have group discussions, right up until the tortoises arrive. But the idea always comes from a child, their daily life, their own experience. That's the most important thing. The village is the ideal experimental site for this project-led teaching. <laughs> the children are able to develop all kinds of projects which boost their skills and fulfillment.
And their ideas are very varied. The eldest can work on building a chicken coop, others on turning a restaurant that closed long ago into a refectory. And in the project to extend the school, of course, no decisions are made without consulting them. So, little by little, the village is coming back to life, just like the old playground, which has been refurbished by the children. They exchanged ideas, discussed them, studied the prices, the materials. They made a scale drawing. They put together a proposal, including safety considerations. They then took the proposal to the town council, who approved it and released money for the project. Then, with a carpenter, they built these little houses, and now it's their playground. For Samael, age six and a half, woodwork is serious. And here, he can use real adults' tools. I'm making something for my hut. The children told us that in most playgrounds, there are only things to play on. But they also wanted to be able to do woodwork. That's why this looks more like a workshop than a play area. These are real tools that they can use. The rules are clear. Safety considerations are discussed with them. And after that, we trust them. Finished. Playing on a life-size scale, working on practical projects, having a whole village as their school prepares the children for real life. In the town, having school outdoors is much harder. But with plenty of effort from those involved, the classroom can be open to the outside here too. Four years ago, in a suburb of Berlin, the Konrad Schule, a state school, opened two forest classes. It doesn't just involve walks in the forest. Every day, the children spend three to five hours outside, the majority of the school day. I was in nursery with her. I've wanted to be in forest class since I was four, and now I'm here. I'm happy because we can really explore. We even saw some wild boar. And deer. Yes. For example, one time we saw a sort of tree trunk that had been split open by a beaver. That was really cool too. Let's concentrate now. You're going to take turns to give me a common noun. It's very simple, but a noun that has a link to the place where we are. If possible, with the article. The tree. The leaves. The grain of sand. The grain of sand. The bench. The forest. Fish. Sticks. Um, uh, humans? Very good. In order to work in the most varied and creative way possible, each day is different and is based around a theme. Today, it's sport. Now, we'll move on to verbs. Before we start our workshop, I want us to make a list of verbs that are the actions you do 
when you do sport. Friedrich? Running. Yes, running. We have that somewhere. Jumping? Jumping. We have that. In the morning, my colleagues and I think about what we're going to do with the children in the forest, what we're going to teach them, in what form, in which teams. And I also use a lot of things the children invent. The forest gives them lots of ideas, and then we have to find a relevant way to use them. To complete the exercise on verbs, the children will become trainers. In small groups, they'll set up sports activities for their classmates. Now you need to put the rope all the way through. Can you put it through? No, the other way. The other way, please. This forest class brings together pupils of three different levels. Each child works to their own abilities and wishes, but everyone joins in the activity. Then you pull on the rope to make it tight. Yes. Here. Yes. They learn from each other. The little children see what the bigger ones are doing and want to be able to do the same. On the other hand, there are some Year 2 pupils who are able to do things which some Year 4 pupils haven't yet mastered. That allows me to stimulate them much more than if they were all the same age. It's impossible without a stick. The children are much more relaxed. They're not jealous or competing with each other. They know from the start that everyone advances at their own speed with the abilities they have. Look up! Why are you looking at your feet? Come on now! It's now time for each team to present their activity to the whole class. May I say one other thing? Go ahead. We should wear gloves. Yes, otherwise it burns our hands. One, two, three. <laughs> it nearly cut my ear off. Two, three, go. It's good that we're not inside all the time because sometimes it's too hot and it's tiring to look at the board all the time. <laughs> wow, those are strong muscles. You have to balance on here. And I think it's good that we don't have to walk in a line and we can play where we want. The forest is big and there are lots of things to play with. There are sticks like this and they make lightsabers for us. Go! <laughs> One metre. You have to measure to the back of the foot. One metre. One metre. One metre, 17 centimetres. Yes. Oh, this is so pretty. <laughs> it's super cool. <laughs> Next. Here? No. You change the function at the top. To start it, you press here once and you stop it here. OK? Ready? And go. Great, Zoe. Give this team a clap.
The class takes place outside in all weathers, unless there's a big storm. Then we're not allowed to go out. But rain isn't a problem at all. It's just a bit more difficult to adapt ideas. If the children have to write that day, and it's pouring with rain, of course it's more complicated. But when it's just raining a little, like it is now, they take a pencil and paper. It might get a bit crumpled, but you can still get to work. The rain and the cold don't stop the class from summing up their day. It's the daily ritual before going home. <laughs> we'll go around quickly. You'll each say what you noticed, what you remembered, and on to the next person. I thought the game was great. I liked rolling in the mud and playing. I thought everything was good. I liked the free play when I played with Marzi and Matilda and the activities. I thought it was a very good rainy day. At first I was annoyed that it rained, but when I see you all like this, I can say that we've had good fun. You're brilliant. Most children who were previously unable to adapt to the school system are later able to return to traditional classes. That is the great success of these forest classes. Bratsch is a laboratory of ideas. Here, it's not the child who adapts to the school, but the school which constantly adapts to each child. Based on their educational research, the teachers offer each child a personalised curriculum featuring all sorts of games. I'm going to put a letter of the alphabet in your hand. You're going to touch it and guess which letter it is. Right, close your eyes and put your blindfolds on. They are encouraged, never forced. And when it comes to reading, each child will start at their own speed when they want to. Some children start earlier, some later. We wait for each child to feel ready themselves and to start working with real motivation. Noelia, which letter do you have? An E. An E. e. Perfect. Serena has chosen a lip reading method from those offered to her. We started with the mouth movements. We learnt A, then E, and then we learnt one per day. A, U, T, uh, B. B. P. Great, that's right. We started writing more and more letters and more and more words and then sentences and then we started to know how to read. So that the pupils can practice reading on their own and at their own speed, Natasha has her own technique. All the family members and their friends and neighbours celebrated the new year. The mummy opened the bottle of champagne and the cork popped. May I taste? asked Stefan. I often give my mobile to the children so they can record themselves reading. That way I can track their progress and assess their reading level compared to the start of the year. Here, the concept of pleasure is central. To help them develop their personal passions, time is set aside for educational activities which the children choose themselves. 
Glasses zum Malen. We can do painting there in the painting room. We can do woodwork. We can play games. Noelia? And Noelia. You have a pair? Great. Very good. We can draw. If we want to do a project, we can sign up over there and have an interview. Digital technology also has its place without displacing other early learning or relaxation activities. We can play on a tablet. We have a timer for 10 minutes and we can play for that time. And now you press her. They're educational games, German, maths and games about nature. But the thing that motivates the children is playing with each other and they use the tablets relatively little. Reality is much more interesting than playing on a tablet. Digital technology is part of our world now, and we can't let the children venture into it without giving them values. It's like reading and writing. When you teach a child to write, it's not to help them send malicious messages. There's no point. But if you teach them to write with the idea of doing good, then this skill will help them to do good. Have a think about this. Where have you seen someone today doing something with their whole heart? Marius. Luca and Samael, they helped at home. Janina? Erica cooked at lunchtime. Erica cooked. That's right. Maya. We want to teach skills to the children, but also values. That's how this digital transformation will be successful, because there are also values to be respected. And especially in this area, the potential to do good is greatly increased. But so is the potential to do evil. And to tackle these changes, we need skills and values. Johan? That I can come to school? Yes, it's great that you come to school, Johan. Sarina? We come to school, we have food to eat and a home. There are lots of people who don't have that. And we're lucky to have it. With a lot of wisdom, Serena describes her recipe for happiness. In a more and more connected society, which tends to isolate us, we need to give children points of reference and values which bring them together. One fine morning, in a garden, close to a forest, there was a pretty house. Nowadays, children are surrounded by screens for the better, but also sometimes for the worse. Teaching them to decode what they see on them is becoming as essential as teaching them to read. And what better way to do that than by allowing them to create the images themselves? That's the project taken on by Beatrice Shenbo, a teacher in France in the Paris suburbs, for her year two class. I've been making little stop-motion animation films for four years now. 
The children are still young, six years old, but already their interest is aroused and it allows them to ask the questions, what is an image? What do you do with it? What can one do with it? In the beginning, there weren't even any films, but a man invented this object. It wasn't exactly like this. It was made of wood and much bigger and all that. And inside, he put little images. I'll let you look, and then you need to look through a slit and you turn it around. Go on. Oh, yes. What's happening? It's moving. What's happening? It's galloping. The horse is galloping. Yes. Oh, yes, it's flying. Here. I don't want to tear it. The little image is one image, then another image, then another, then another, then another. So the images have been placed one after another, after another. And when you turn it and the images go quickly, you have the impression that it's moving. It's an impression. And now to work. First, they need to write a story. For that, Beatrice Shenbo is using a book without any text. Thomas. When you were imagining the story in your head, did you think of a title? Or maybe you didn't have a title. It was too quick. Leah, did you think of a title? What did you think of? A goldfish. A goldfish, yes, that's true. Mohammed? I thought of the lost fish. The lost fish? Why do you think he's lost? What makes you think that he's lost? Because he hasn't got his friends or his family. That's good, isn't it? The lost goldfish? Yes. The lost goldfish is... The lost fish? Or the little lost fish? Yes, little. Because it's a little fish. Yes. Shall we put that? Yes. The little lost fish. Now, what can we write? Here. Mohammed. Once upon a time, there was a fish and a cat. Once upon a time? Shall we start like that? Yes! Having a project is very motivating for the class. The children's ideas are heard. It's about living together, allowing others to speak. That was his idea. Oh, yes, that was a good idea. We'll go with that. They don't feel like they're working. And then when we come back to the basic learning, they're more into it because they haven't been doing only that all day. And so the year is given a bit of a boost. Really? Yes! Then the pandemic came, and the school year was disrupted. But, come what may, the class continued to work on their stop-motion film. And the film starts here. Those are our two characters, the cat and the fish. The backdrops, the pipes for the little fish to swim around in. The materials to make the pipes, to make the water, to make the little fish, the fishnet and the clouds. For the closing titles, the whole class has worked on a grid which links up the children's names like a crossword puzzle. You can start from a P in Apolline, so you don't need your first P. To make a stop motion, we need... Three, three things. things. We need a... Backdrop. We need a... Camera. And we need a... Computer. Right. That's not bad. Right. He's taken the photo. Now we'll push the letters a little bit towards the edge so that they all disappear at some stage. But they won't disappear with you. It'll maybe be the last person who's moving the letters. You see? They hardly move. It's there. starting to look a bit of a mess. Yes, it is starting to look a bit of a mess. You're right, Apolline. 
This method allows the children to manipulate things physically. They're doing the action. And that way, they'll realize what it means to create a film, create an animation, create a moving picture. I think it goes in when they do the manipulation. They need to participate to absorb the ideas. And the A? That's good. Come and take the photo. Mind you don't get your friend's hands in it. Great. For the first time, the children discover the result of their work. We've taken the pictures, and we're going to put them one after another. So when we look at them one after another, we're going to have the impression that it's moving. That it's moving. Let's watch it. But we did it in the other direction. Ah, well spotted, Apolline. We did it in the other direction. So what's going to happen now? It's going to make the names. It's going to make the names? In the right order. As they should be. I'm starting to see my name. I can see my name too. Matisse is all there now. There we are. Did everyone see their name? Yes. yes. Did you like it? Yes. It's really funny. With filming and voice recording, the project also supports more conventional learning. Perfect. Poisson. Fish, seven letters. Hop. Off you go. Stop motion allows us to make them aware of how the image works. I make them touch it with their finger so that the image is constructed, the image is modified, and it can be used and adapted to give a particular meaning to a message. By training them to open their eyes and their mind to the world around them, the teacher guides the child in the fulfillment of their potential. Between guide and pupil, a relationship of trust grows and is maintained. In Brach, in order to grow in confidence, each child chooses a mentor from the teaching team. This confidant helps them to make their own decisions. Today, it's time for Serena's individual meeting with Natasha. Serena, on a scale of one to 10, how do you feel at the moment? Um, very good. Draw a line where you see yourself. Good. So, at the moment, it's not bad, but it's not perfect. What is it that's placing you a bit under 10, rather than at 10? But that's good. OK. So, what do you like? Being here and talking together. Talking in the meeting. So, you like your individual meetings? <laughs> What would you like to do to feel even better? Um, I'd like to do a project where we sleep at school and we have a sort of unicorn party. OK, so we always look at the other projects going on, which ones are working, so that you can all join in. There's already a sleepover project. You could all come here together, and that would be enough sleepovers for this year. Do you understand? So you're not disappointed. I think you could join this sleepover project that's already in preparation. 
I don't know if that's possible. I think they'd be very happy if you asked them. I've got another idea. Yes? We could organise a party with everyone. With the whole school? Yes. So, you're always allowed to have two projects. Your first one is the tortoise project, and that's going well. Although they're hibernating at the moment, so there isn't much work. <laughs> the important thing is that you don't have too much in your head, that there's no more than two projects. You already have German, maths, sometimes drawing, reading, and all those things, and I'm worried it would be too much for you. So I'd rather we start with two, and if you find that's not enough, we can take a third one on, OK? At the start of a project, they're always very motivated. They want to succeed. And then in our meeting, we talk about what's needed and the work the children have to do. Sometimes we find the motivation drops off because they have to do things they don't necessarily want to. But they're essential to the project. That's why my job isn't necessarily to motivate the children, but to preserve their motivation, so it remains intact. OK, so you have your sleepover project, and I wanted to ask if I could do it with you. Yes, of course you can. <laughs> Sharing ideas, setting up projects together, being attentive to others, team spirit, all these things are learned. Can I come with you, Charlene? I already told her no before. Even in a friendly environment, occasional disputes can still crop up. But we want it to be just us. The four of us made the hut. Charlene, Miko, Andrine and Elia. You made your hut over there, right? Reina, what would you like? We'd like to play with them, but they just give us orders all the time, because they were first. By inviting both parties to give their viewpoint, Natasha starts the discussion. She guides the children towards non-violent communication to reconcile them with themselves and each other. to a different dimension, a different climate from the Swiss mountains. In France, in another suburban part of Paris, the playground of Victor Hugo School brings together 300 pupils. And the educational choice here is a bold one, to teach the pupils to settle their problems between themselves. Good morning. You're here to learn how to be mediators. Do you remember what a mediator is for? Do you have that in mind? Vanina. They settle problems when friends have an argument. Yes, almost. The mediator doesn't settle disputes directly. Their job is to help two people who are arguing to talk to each other and therefore find a solution to their problem. Pupil mediators are the solution adopted by the teachers at Victor Hugo with the support of the organization Mediactors to resolve the problems of frequent violence in the school. Six or seven years ago, we had a difficult atmosphere in the school with complicated children, and we tried to find a solution that wasn't just a crackdown. 
I wanted to be a mediator because I wanted to resolve the disputes of my friends and other people. I wanted to be a mediator because last year there was a girl who was a mediator and I thought it was good, so I said to myself, I'm going to be a mediator. This year, 12 pupils in years two and three are going to learn how to be mediators. During this training, we're going to learn lots of things. We'll start by talking about others and yourself. We'll learn that each person is unique. We'll talk about needs. Then we'll talk about communication, how we talk to each other. Then we'll do some work on emotions, because when we're in a dispute, we have very strong emotions. And then we'll talk about disputes and how to do a mediation so everything turns out well. So that's the training we're going to do. And then you can start to work in the playground as mediators. In the meantime, the pupils trained in previous years are on duty. And to stay at the top of their game, they sometimes role-play a mediation under the watchful eye of the teachers. Whatever is said is between ourselves confidentially. Everyone will speak in turn, calmly, and they'll have equal time to speak. Everyone will show willing. The aim is to find a solution with no winner or loser, which suits everyone. What happened? I had a ball, and Raphael came up and pushed me. And then I got angry and I scratched him next to his eye. I didn't push her. You didn't push her. You did. If I understand, you had the ball and Raphael came up. He wanted to play. He pushed you and then you scratched him. That's right. Then I scratched him. What emotions did you feel? I was angry and sad. I was hurt and I was sad. Do you have a solution? Yes, I do. When I have a ball, he can ask me if he can play. If I say yes, then he can. So he doesn't need to push me. And I'll be careful not to scratch him. Is that all right with you, Raphael? Yes. Right, the mediation is over. Thank you. Mediators Elise and Killian don't forget the stages. If you're not sure, they're up there. One, two, three, four. The role of the mediator in the playground is firstly to be visible to everyone. There's a rotor, so there are always two mediators in the playground playing with friends at every break. They come to this mediation area to explain how the mediation works, to tell them that the first task is to listen to each other and that there's no winner or loser. He wasn't even playing, but he came up and touched me. I was playing and uh, I just arrived. And as you nearly arrived, I touched you and you said, no, no. 99 times out of 100, the matter stops there. They both go away happy because they've been able to say something. And psychologically, it's great to get something off your chest when it's fresh and not let it fester. A miracle solution, perhaps? Even if it can't resolve everything, mediation by the pupils themselves has paid off at Victor Hugo. The year we launched this, we had fights in the playground. We no longer have that physical violence in the school. We don't have fights or situations like that anymore. We had children who hit to really hurt each other. We don't see that anymore. And we don't have children that we have to keep close to us at break times, or even exclude from break times. That doesn't happen anymore. Everyone will show willing. Putting the child at the heart of the system 
even in a dispute, makes the pupils regulate themselves more and more readily. And there's a snowball effect. So more and more, the pupils copy each other and realize that I might only be in year two, but I know that in this school, I'm going to be respected. Wait for me, wait for me! The sunny weather has arrived, and the village of Bratch is livelier than ever. <laughs> In the garden of the Swiss school, the tortoise project has become a reality. This one is Lily, das this is one is Coco, Coco. and das that one's Polly. They're funny, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> We've become <laughs> friends. We wouldn't be here together without this project. We made a big sign. And we wrote and drew everything on it that we've learned with the tortoise project. We learned about the different species of turtles and tortoises. We've learned that it takes a lot of work to have tortoises. I thought it would take a few months, but it took the whole year. It does indeed take a lot of work to become experts in tortoises. With maths, German and writing, it formed the curriculum for a whole school year, which they've learnt with enthusiasm. The other groups have also progressed with their own projects, by small steps or great strides. As a result, although the school in Bratsch has only existed for four years, the pupils' results are already above average for the schools in the canton. And here, nine plus six? Fifteen. Are you sure? Yes. Yeah. School used to be considered as the main means of transferring knowledge. The village teacher was the only person who owned books. They knew things that other people were unable to access. Today, knowledge is accessible. It's constantly evolving with new inventions every day. Instead of focusing on the transfer of knowledge, we should be concentrating on the development of personal and social skills, which are essential in every field. Among these skills, being useful to the community is naturally learnt in the refectory. The children take turns to share in the cooking and cleaning without complaining. When we come to help in the kitchen, we have to cook well so that most of the children like it. And I think that's cool. We learn a lot of things by cooking. The world today is changing completely. There are lots of new professions appearing, and that's not about to stop. So we have to adapt. And if a child knows how to learn, get help, and work as part of a group, with those skills, they'll be able to learn any knowledge. Thank you. Learning to learn, learning curiosity, learning to seek out knowledge wherever it is. Isn't that the best gift for future generations? <laughs>